بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله عدد كمال الله كما يليق بكماله يا عليم علمنا من علمك ما ترضى به عنا ولا تؤاخذنا بما تعلمه منا يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق العلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم Tonight we want to talk about three things if possible and the first of them is the nature of causation cause and effect natural laws nature and mechanistic causation and uh, then after that we want to talk about the issue of human choice um, is the human being free to choose and is the human being in the context of reality in which God knows all he knows everything that will be and God wills all that happens and he has power over it is my action then anything more than just an apparition is it really mine and am I responsible for it so we will talk about that topic in reality we're just introducing that topic and then inshallah we would like to talk about the issue of good and evil and in that regard we talk about uh, what in the Islamic tradition we refer to as al-hasan wal-qabih that which is beautiful and that which is ugly um, that is again a cognitive frame you know when we talk about good and evil then we are putting an ethical um, criterion on our examination of reality and especially when we talk about God uh, those ethical standards which apply to us they do not apply to him and when we talk about good and evil in English we're also talking about things like earthquakes and tidal waves and starvation and plagues and disease and these are things which often the degree to which human beings have to do with them is not clear so uh, when we talk about al-qabih wal-hasan al-hasan wal-qabih then all of these things come into the picture and one of the things that I like myself about the cognitive frame of al-hasan and al-qabih the beautiful and the ugly is the fact that um, it approaches this aesthetically and not ethically so inshallah we will try to talk about all of those in a meaningful way bi ta'ala in terms of free will here we are talking about the act of God and we're talking about the act of the empowered and um, ethically equipped human being the mukallaf the human being who is mukallaf the human being who has the gift of taklif and the right of taklif <coughs> and we believe that the act of God is one and we believe that creation is his act and that everything that happens in it are manifestations of that act and God's act is one of total efficiency it is creative and it is the act of the fa'al 
فَعَالٌ لِمَا يُرِيدٌ He who acts in the greatest efficiency, uh, he whose act uh, cannot be, uh, you know, who is absolutely complete and effective, and his act is also imbued with wisdom, his act is also an act of power, his act is also an act of justice or of bounty. And we believe that all primary causation is uh, a function of God's act. So a free will then is talking about how do we acquire that act so that it is ours. But before that, we'll talk about the issue of natural causation. Um, and in, in Islamic belief, primary causation is God's and God's alone. So he is the mu'athar. He is the musabbib al-asbab, musabbib al-asbab. He is the one who makes things happen. He is the one who makes the fire burn. He makes the water quench my thirst. He makes the food benefit me or harm me. All the things that happen in the world, uh, they are in his hand. In our theological tradition, we believe that that is constantly the case, even to the extent that the continuity in these things that exist around us, the continuity of their attributes, which as you know, are changing attributes, potentially and effectively changing attributes, that the continuity of something as solid as the rock on this table, you know, is only an appearance. It is not real. It is from moment to moment, moment to moment. God who is the creator is also God who is the sustainer. And he who creates the atoms that go around, uh, that, that have their electrons and protons going around in these orbits, that these things are created and recreated every moment. And the continuity that we see in creation is an appearance, and it is a reality. But it is like the frames of a film, that if we look at the film in the movie theater, where all the frames are following each other rapidly, then it actually looks like the people are speaking and moving. But if we were to look at each frame, you know, it is still. And then the next frame is somewhat like it. And the next one is somewhat like it. So this is also the way that reality works. That these things do not have continuity in and of themselves. God, Azza wa Jal, who is the creator of nothing. He is the creator from nothing. He also remains the creator of nothing at all times and places. He is the one who sustains the world. He gives ijad and he gives imdad. He gives existence and then he gives the continuity of that existence in these things. This is a function of will. Therefore, if God willed that this table not continue to exist, it would cease to exist. Or in the case of the throne of Bilqis, the great queen of Saba of Sheba, when Solomon wants to bring her throne to Jerusalem, the center of his kingdom, he asks, who will bring me her throne? And the Ifrit of the jinn, who is a scholar of the jinn, a very knowledgeable and powerful leader of the jinn, uh, it's just for him a question of time. I can arrange that. I can have it brought to you before this session is over, maybe 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it will be. But the wali of Allah, who said to be, have had the name of Asif, you know, the wali of Allah in the court of Solomon, he says, I can bring it to you before the blink of an eye. And there it is. And how does he do that? It's also interesting that he says, I can bring it to you. How can he do that? He's just a human being. He has all the attributes of contingency and weakness 
and ineffectuality that all of us have in our essence, but you know, he is the wili of Allah. So that when he asks God in this beautiful way that is a reflection of his perfect heart, then God responds. He answers his prayer. As he says of the wali, I do, he does not ask me, but that I give him. And so then what God does, as some of our scholars have said, is simply that he does not recreate the throne of the Queen of Sheba in its place in the Yemen, but in the next moment he creates it, he recreates it there in front of Solomon. So some scholars say there is no transportation at all. It's just that the throne is not given continuity in the Yemen, and then its continuity is immediately resumed right there before Solomon. So this we believe to be the structure of reality. And لا تأخذن في الأمور بظاهر فإن ظواهر تخدع الرائين You know, do not adhere, um, you know, in the things, in understanding the things that you see with mere appearances. Because appearances deceive those who look. They deceive those who look upon them. And this is what our Aqidah is enabling us to do. To be able to look at the surface of reality and to penetrate it. To be able to see the depth that is there. The miracle that is there. We've talked so many times about the atom. I mean, I can't get over that myself. From the first time I read about that, it's just stuck in my mind. These are miracles. The existence of the rock, the existence of the soil, the existence of the cell, these are all miracles. None of them can account for themselves. But the reality is that God is the Haq who is always with His creation. He is not in it or outside of it, not to the right or to the left of it, but He is closer to me than my juggler vein, and He's closer to the atom than the atom or the molecule or, or than the molecule is to itself. So this is his reality. Continuity then is an appearance of the constant function of the will of God. He creates from nothing. His power brings into existence. His power maintains in existence by imdad. And if he willed, these things would cease to be. There would be no sound, no dust, no crush, it would be gone. I would be gone, everything would be gone. He is the sustainer. So therefore, um, secondary cause and effect, which is the power of the fire to burn, uh, the blessing of the water to quench my thirst, um, all of these things that we see in the world, you know, the ability of the saw to cut the wood, the ability of the hammer to drive the nail in the wood, all of these are direct functions of the primary causation of God in every moment. He is always with His creation. He is always um, making these things happen. Also because this is the case, then this reality of apparent causation that we study, it is the matter of science, it is valid to study, there's no problem with that. We are simply studying the custom of God in creation. So we study medicine and science and physics and chemistry. There's no inhibition there. But again, we understand what is the reality of this. So in all of this causation, if ever he wills to suspend it, then he does. So therefore, if his servant of God, Abraham, who is an infallible prophet, and who never worshipped other than God, even though he's, he's born among Babylonians, you know, who virtually have lost the knowledge of God. You know, he will never worship that. This is a proof against us. But then as a young man, when he destroys the idols, except for the big idols, and then uh, Nimrod, Nimrod builds the big fire and casts it, him into it. God says to the fire, Kuni bardan wa salaman li ala Ibrahim. Right? And this is possible. This is not impossible. This is not, this is not irrational. This is rational to the highest possible degree. 
God has power over the fire and all fires. He can make it hot. He can make it cold. He can make it peaceful for Abraham. And all the miracles of the prophets, they attest to that, as do also the miracles of the awliya, because we must believe that the awliya have karamat. We don't have to believe every story, because some of the stories that are told are fictitious. We have to make sure the stories are properly transmitted, just like we make sure about everything else. People make up stories also, but some of them we know for sure are true. Especially when we look at people like Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, may Allah be pleased with him, Allah empowered him with karamat. And many of his karamat were witnessed by a thousand people or more. They are mutawatir, as, uh, as Abdul Aziz bin Abdul Salam says when he talks about that, that these are usually mutawatir. They happened in the presence of the caliph, they happened in the, prince, the, in the presence of emirs, they happened in the assembly of the people of Baghdad who would sit in front of him. So these are true. And the Sahaba have karamat. You know, we know about Umar, for example, when there was the war party that was thousands of miles away, and they are going into an ambush. And he says, Sariyat al Jabal. Right? He, 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 he's on the mimbar and he just says that. And maybe he's not even conscious of the fact that he says it. And people said, why did you say that? And then the people that are there, they hear him. And then they see the ambush and they're not harmed by it. So these are realities. These are realities. And again, it's because God is able to do with his creation whatever he wants. This is why also when we come to talk about the sam'iyat, the things that are heard, uh, the life of the grave, the reward of the grave, the punishment of the grave, the angels. When we talk, we talk about the resurrection, we talk about the judgment, the fire and the garden and things like that. There's nothing impossible about this whatsoever. These are other infinite possibilities in the realm of, realm of possibility. It is simply a matter of the will of God. Does He will to do this or not? If He does, case closed. And we know that through Revelation. So this is as real as anything in this world that we know. We must not be in the stupor of taking Ada, customary experience, and generalizing about it as if it were the truth, as if it were necessary, because it's not. So therefore, when we talk about causation, uh, we use the word sabab, sabab, S-A-B-A-B -B in English, sabab, which you all know in Arabic. And sabab is another one of those words which is perfect for our use. So literally, the word sabab is, it's a rope. It's like the rope that you put in the top of the palm tree so that you can climb up and you can get the dates. It's a means to an end. Or we could also say it's a link. And when we talk about causation, the causation that we study in physics or chemistry or any other, any other field, we never see causation. Causation itself is a metaphysical reality. It is not a physical reality. What we see is connection. We see that A comes first and is connected to B and then you have C. Okay? We see that the fire is there. We put the dry paper in the fire and the fire burns. The conviction that the fire does that in and of itself is a psychological generalization. It is a psychological belief. That is not what we saw with our eyes. What we saw with our eyes was only the connection of the sabab with the musabab. The sabab being the link of causation, the fire with the thing that is caused, the musabab. Okay, that's what, and so again, our language of causation is, very, is scientific, it is empirical, it is an exact description of reality as we see it. Muslims have written about this for centuries. In the Enlightenment period, in the 1700s, uh, David Hume, the Scottish materialist, um, you know, he actually takes that over. 
And I'm not sure that it's been proven that he took it from a particular Islamic source. Um, all of these people were very much affected by Islamic writing. It's been shown, for example, uh, that Immanuel Kant, who's also one of the most important thinkers of the Enlightenment, that he's very much affected by Al-Ghazali. And that, uh, in fact, his uh, prolegomena to any future metaphysics, which is one of his most famous works, that it even follows the structure of, um, of Al-Ghazali's work. So there's probably Islamic influence here. But the thing is that this is exactly what Hume says, that, the, that causation is a belief. We believe in material causation, but we never see it. All we see is the connection between A and B, and then we see the thing that customarily res results from that. So this is careful language. And again, it is language that gives you the cognitive frame that is sufficient and that is correct and empowering and it enables us to look at reality um, in the soundest way. So um, when we talk about this then, you know, we see again that these things that exist in the world and these um, causes that take place in the world, they are veils of power that they are real things that are happening. But beyond the outward level of what happens there, there is the power of God that is continually at work, that is a function of the will of God in pre-existence that made the choices about the structure of reality and what would happen in it that was based on his infinite knowledge about that. So we do not see material causation. You know, it is a psychological habit. You know, what we see are the links between things and the connections between them. And that is valid scientific material. So we study it and we must study it carefully. Okay, there's no problem with that. It's just how do we understand that metaphysically? And how do we understand that? Uh, in terms of theology, that's another issue. Um, often we speak of nature and we speak of natural laws. And if we look at the philosophy of science in the West, um, Westerners have written a lot of brilliant things about science and the philosophy of science. And there is a large, there's an extensive literature in the West that emphasizes that natural laws are not laws. Natural laws, we name them, we name them that. In fact, it would be good for us, I believe, to have a better name. Because laws have this sort of categorical aspect. Again, we can say they're natural laws in that they're divine laws. It's the sunnah of Allah that he has set down, but they are generalizations. Natural laws are generalizations. Natural laws are descriptions. Uh, natural laws um, organize experience. Natural laws are invented. We are the ones who invent them. Uh, natural laws are not deductively valid. In other words, they are not the product of any necessary connection between one proposition and another. They pertain to the realm of possibility. We know that they are true, they show themselves to be true a thousand times, a million times over, but they are not deductively valid. They do not have the power of a statement like the deductively valid statement that change shows temporality. That's deductively valid. Natural laws are not that way. Um, they are um, um, they are postulates, okay? They are presumptions. They are necessary presumptions about reality. We are the ones who give laws to nature. Nature does not establish or dictate those laws. 
Um, nature does not prescribe laws. Uh, they are provisional. And of course, in modern science, this is something that we're very much aware of because of the fact that uh, in the Enlightenment period from the 1600s into the 1700s, then into the 19th and 20th century, you know, we were dominated by a worldview dictated very much by Newtonian physics. And Newtonian physics appeared to Westerners at that time with few exceptions. There were notable exceptions to that. Um, like Lotze, who was a great German philosopher, L-O-T-Z-E, but you know, for them it's like, this is it, this is reality, this is the ultimate statement. As we said before, uh, Newtonian physics has in it a fundamental dichotomy, the dichotomy between the point and between the wave. And it was believed that that is essential to the structure of the universe. Some people say that wherever you find any kind of dichotomy like that or dualism, you know that you don't have the ultimate truth. But this is what the whole view of the world, the mechanistic view of the world as a clock in which God just creates the clock and he starts it ticking and then it goes on for generations. It's all based on these Newtonian ideas. They become more and more sophisticated in many cases in the course of the 19th century in particular. But then in the 19th century, you have you know, the introduction of relativity, special relativity, general re relativity. And this is a major revolution in human thought. And then also after the development of relativity and the advance of atomic theory, you have uh, the appearance of quantum mechanics, which is advanced nuclear physics in which all of a sudden we discover that cause and effect as we understand it in a Newtonian world, it no longer works in the atom. And in fact, we even see that in the atom, the distinction between whether or not the electron is a point or whether it is a wave can no longer be made, can no longer be made. It breaks down. So the electron behaves sometimes like a wave and sometimes it behaves like a particle, particle and wave. This is a major change and this has huge effect on the 20th century as it develops because it introduces a whole notion of relativism which is often very philosophically destructive into Western thought. But for us, this is a very intelligible description of reality because reality ultimately does not have any inherent or essential cause and effect. So in our tradition then, um, we do not believe in natural causation as independent causation. And we do not believe in what we can call, mechan what I call mechanistic causation as independent causation. Um, when we talk about natural causation, what we're talking about is causation in the natural world, such as the fire burning or the water quenching, that is conditioned. This is how our scholars make that distinction. So, you know, for the water to quench, there have to be certain conditions. For example, I have to be healthy. And for the fire to burn, there has to be certain conditions. The fire has to have a certain intensity. The thing that is being burned has to have a certain, um, a, you know, a certain, um, you know, it has to be dry and it has to be something that can receive the fire. So there are conditions there. As for mechanistic cause, they mean by that, the general, the example that they often give is that of a ring on the finger. So if I have a ring on my finger and I move the ring, there's no doubt in my outward intellect that the, that the finger caused the movement of the ring. But in our theology, we say that's just an appearance that this pertains to the continuity of the structures of reality. And those structures in reality behave that way because God keeps them in continuity. If he willed that I move my, my finger and the ring not move, that's possible. Not impossible, 
I don't ever expect it to happen in my life. And this mechanistic causation is the thing that we see when the hammer hits the nail or, you know, when the screwdriver turns the screw or when the pistons move in the car and they move the motor. Okay, we expect that to work and we study it. And we study it in engineering and physics and we know that it, it, it obeys a whole series of things that we can work out mathematically and we can predict and we can expect it to occur. But nevertheless, this is always a veil of power. And we must not be deceived by it. We will study it as a sunnah of Allah in creation. And we will have adab with it. We will never expect that the food will not be beneficial for us or that I could do without it or that the poison will not poison or the fire will not burn. That would be wrong and that would be impolite. It would be lack of adab. And yet all of these things are totally under the power of God to create them, to keep them in reality and to make them work. Okay? So therefore, the belief in actual causation that is in the thing, in other words, um, the fire has the power in it to burn and it must burn if the conditions are right. Our scholars say that's kufr. That is ignorance of God. So, and again, don't confuse that. We will respect the fire as behaving that way because this is the sunnah of God. This is the pattern of reality. We will not change the physics books at all. We will make them deeper and more profound. And when we work with mechanics and mechanical causation, we have no doubt that that, work, that works. We don't expect the cogs in the wheel, wheel not to turn the wheel if everything is right. But nevertheless, all of these are functions of the way that reality works, which is created from nothing and continually under the knowledge, the will, and the power of God. Okay, so therefore, causation is God's prerogative. And He makes it work in the world. And we study that. But we don't worship that. And we also do not ever reject the possibility that it might not work. On December the 15th of 2011, for example, a comet that the, that the astronomers called Lovejoy, you know, was shooting towards the sun. It had been on that trajectory for a long time. And we don't know of any instances, if I'm not, this is what I read in any case, I'm not an astronomer, where a comet actually shoots into the sun and comes out. That was regarded to be impossible because it does not customarily happen. And yet, from the news that we received, I presume that that's true, and the pictures that we saw on the internet, God forbid, <laughs> you know, on the 15th of December, Lovejoy went into the sun, you know, deep into the sun and came out on the other side. Okay, and this was amazing. And no doubt there may also be physical explanations that we now discover that make it clear why that happened. But these things can happen. And history is filled with examples like that. And the prophets, their miracles are all examples of that. You know, you cannot walk on water, but Jesus walked on the water. This is a miracle. And many of the saints of Islam are reported to do the same thing, even the Sahaba. So again, if that report was transmitted to us by honest people, truthful people, and it was properly transmitted, that's the way it is. And the rise of Islam, the victories of Islam, the consolidation of Islamic civilization, it's filled with the miraculous. And we believe in that. We believe in the miraculous. We believe that God can do in the world of possible being whatever He wants. The staff of Moses is a stick. They, have, they say that they have it in Topkapi in Istanbul. I've seen it. Um, the rabbis gave that to the Ottoman Sultan. The Ottoman, Ottoman Sultan was 
one of the greatest protectors of Jews in the history of humanity. And the rabbis loved him of all the different sects of the Jews, and they gave him many gifts. And one of them, they say, is the staff of Moses. And I don't doubt that it's a staff. It's a very simple sort of looking thing. It's not what you would believe. It's not curved or anything like that. But this staff has its continuity as a piece of wood by the will of God, by the grace of God. And if God tells Moses, throw it to the ground, and then he turns it into a serpent, there is nothing impossible about that. If I cannot believe that, then the problem I have is with my knowledge of God, that I do not know the reality of necessary being, and I do not know the total contingency, the total dependence of possible being on necessary being for its very existence and for every aspect of its structure and its change in the history of time and place. So if God wills, he can turn it into an elephant, he can turn it into a camel, he can turn it into a mountain, he can turn it into anything that he wills. And this is what he willed. So Moses throws the staff and it becomes a serpent. It is a big serpent, serpent that moves like a little serpent. And then when Moses comes to the sorcerers of Egypt, and sorcery was at the very heart of Egyptian religion, we know this from the study of Egyptian religion. Uh, and the name was essential to sorcery in Egyptian religion. This is the reason why even if you have a god like Ra, Ra, who was the great god of the north, who is Al-Zahir, he's like the sun in its zenith. Uh, he says in some of his poems, I am Ra, creator of the heavens and the earth, creator of the gods. I do this, I do this, I do this, and no one knows my name. In other words, I have a name which is hidden because they, were, they believe that if you know the hidden name, you know, then you can even have power over the God. Egyptian sorcery was based on things like that, and they were masters of sorceries. And so when, they come to, when Moses comes to Pharaoh and he puts the staff on the ground and it turns to a serpent, this is sorcery. We have sorcerers. They can do that too. And when they bring their ropes, they do sorcery. They can't turn the rope into a serpent, but they can make it appear that way. They can make it look like it moves in the eyes of the people. And also the sorcerers know Moses. Moses grows up in the house of Pharaoh. Moses could have been a Pharaoh. He speaks perfect Egyptian. He is known to all of them. All of them have known them since he was a boy. They know that he is honest. They know that he is good. They know that he's been oppressed and so forth. And when Moses throws his staff to the ground and it turns into a serpent, they can see that. And then it swallows their ropes and it doesn't even become fat. And then it turns back into the staff that it was. So they know this is miraculous. This man is a messenger of God who has God with him. And as the Quran says, and the Bible says also, then they follow Moses. And the fact that this means certain death doesn't make any difference. We know who you are. We have known you since the time that you were born. We know that you do not lie. And we know that this is God's grace to you, that he's made you a messenger. It's very interesting in the story of Egypt in the Quran that all of the Egyptians who believe in Moses are outstanding. The believer in Ali Fir'aun, the wife of Pharaoh, the sorcerers, they are people who are powerful believers and true believers. And then on the other hand, you have the response of the children of Israel, you know, which is exactly the opposite of that. It's like no matter what they see, no matter what they go through, you know, it doesn't mean very much to them. <clears throat> okay, so um, inshallah from that, bi idhnillahi ta'ala, we want to move to the next topic. And after we talk about causation, then we talk also about human action. Do I have an act? What is the nature of my act? Am I free to choose? Am I free to do? Uh, am I truly and justly and honestly responsible for what I do? 
And Muslims have analyzed that in a particular theological way, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And we'll talk about that, but the most important thing is the fact that we concur that human beings are free. We concur that human beings have the power to act and that our lordly attributes, what are our lordly attributes? Our sifat rabbaniya. What are your lordly attributes? Iman. How many are they? Nelly. Seven, seven, right? You have life. You have knowledge. You have will to choose. You have power to do. You hear and you see and you can speak. So you have attributes which share the same names as these ummahat as-sifat, these foundational attributes of God. These are our lordly attributes and these are real and these are efficacious. This is what we believe. Whether I am able in my ignorance to make sense of that to you tonight, that's another question. I hope that I will succeed and not fail. But this is what we believe, and as we said before, this is why it's attributed, attributed to Imam Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, karram Allahu wajhahu, and also to Al-Hasan and to other uh, of their descendants that they said, Al-Amru Bayn Al-Bayn, that this matter is between two extremes, La Jabra wa La Tafweed. Okay, there is no jabr. Jabr is that I, whatever I say or do or choose is just a metaphor. That I am like a leaf in the wind. Whatever way the wind goes, that's the way I go. It looks like I choose, but in the reality I'm not. I'm musayyar. I'm not mukhayyar. That's jabr. And that was regarded in our tradition to be kufr, disbelief. That is a false theological pronouncement, especially because of the fact that it denies the meaning of the law. All prophetic law, from before Moses to Moses, through the prophets, to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is based on the proposition that you are mukallaf that you are morally empowered and also you are morally encumbered. You've got to obey, you've got to do right, you've got to do it to the best of your ability. So to say that I don't have any free will, that's to say that the whole law then is a mockery, that all ethical propositions are a farce, and that is very serious, that's kufr. So, la jabra wa la tafweed. Nor does God turn the matter over to you completely. Because the human act is complex. The human act has wujul. Okay? And it is not a simple matter. And it is not for me to create things. Some of the qadris would say that they create their acts. And it's said that a qadri was once speaking with a Sunni. And he reached up, he was under an apple tree and he picked an apple. And he said, did I not create that app? Did I not do that? I'm going to pick the apple. I reach up, I picked it. Did I not make this act? Am I not the one who initiated this and created it? And his partner said, if that's true, put it back on the tree. Connect it back to the tree if you have this creative power. So there's no tofweed, there's no tofweed. It is not turned over to us. It is not relegated to us. Everything that we do is under the auspices of divine knowledge, divine will, and divine power. But in that, we have area, sufficient area to work. Wala ikraha, wala tasliq. And we are not constrained to do the things that we don't want to do. We're not forced to do the things that we dislike. We choose and we do that thing. And there's no taslit either. We're not empowered totally to function in this world as if we were creators. 
Okay, al amru bayn al bayn. And in one of the transmissions, it was said that what the distance between these two extremes is like the distance between heaven and earth. In our theological tradition, therefore, um, we have the doctrine of what we call acquisition. And in Arabic, that's called kesb and iktisab. And the words are taken from the Qur'an. Okay? Kesaba and iktesaba. So it's taken from that. And we believe that you have the power to acquire your acts. And that in the complexity of the human act, whenever we choose to do something, and of course in human beings we have two types of acts. We have those which are ikhtiyari and those that are iltirari. Those which are a matter of choice and those that are not. So for example, my heartbeat is not ikhtiyari and I don't think about it. I might be able to train myself so that I can focus on my heart and maybe slow the heartbeat or speed it up. But generally, most of what I do in terms of my human functions, that is clearly a matter of God's decree and His will. So that if something moves quickly by my eye, I'm going to blink my eye. I don't think about it. Okay, we have these natural reactions. The blood keeps flowing in my veins. And we have this incredible system, you know, this amazing human body. So that if a germ comes into my body, or a virus comes into my body, the, I don't know anything about that, but the body does. And it immediately begins to work with that. The white blood cells, the red blood cells, and so forth. And if I'm healthy and I have the blessing of Allah, then I stay healthy. These are amazing things. This is not a matter of choice. This is our iltirari dimension. Our dimension that is not under our choice. But when it comes to ethical things and religious things and the way that we live, the way that we speak, the way that we interact with each other, here I have ikhtiyar. And that ikhtiyar is absolutely genuine, absolutely real. And we are responsible for what we do. So we refer to this as the doctrine of kesb. And in the doctrine of kesb, we believe that in every human act, two knowledges come together, two wills come together, and two powers. First of all, there is the knowledge and the will of God, who knew that this would happen, who willed that this would happen, and who created that act at the instance of my will, but not by my will. Okay, so we say that I have a knowledge too. My knowledge is very limited. You know, my knowledge is very conditioned. But my knowledge is also real. So on the basis of my knowledge, my sound conception of reality, or my misconception of reality. I know, or I believe that I know, that certain things are true, and I have a will. That among the different possibilities of what I can do, and often our choices may be one out of two or three, it's not one out of infinity, as it is with God, then I select that I will do that. I will come here tonight to teach. You know, and then, you know, we will do something else after that and do something else. And I want to go to the airport you know, at the right time so I get my flight, okay? I have knowledge about that. I have expectations about that. And my will has also made decisions about that. And then I have a temporal power, a created power, a kudra, that enables me to acquire the act. And God creates the act at the instance of my power, at the instance of my will, but not by it. And so there is this harmony between those two things. And I am the actor, I am acquiring the will. As a matter of course, whatever it is that I know I should do, or I am determined on the basis of my understanding to do, and I have the will to do, then God will create that act for me. 
So I want to lift my hand, he creates that, he gives that to me, he tests me by that. Will I be thankful? Will I be unthankful? Will I use that for good? Will I use that for evil? إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ niyat. Actions are according to intentions, they're according to my heart, even though my heart is also a great secret. Okay, so this is um, the, the doctrine of kasb. And in this, you know, for example, if we look at the life of Imam Ghazali, may Allah be pleased with him. Imam Al Ghazali is one of the greatest scholars in Islamic history. And he is an absolutely amazing human being. What you know about him and what I know about him is only the tip of the iceberg. He was a remarkable human being. He was extremely handsome, he was charismatic, he was very gifted, uh, he did not live very long. They say that he hurt himself because of the fact that he studied so intensely in his childhood and youth that he damaged his health. But he was an amazing scholar with an amazing mind. And then, you know, he lives in the times of the Seljuks and Nidham al-Mulk and Nidham al-Mulk, may Allah have mercy upon him. He creates the Madrasa system, which becomes like the university system of Islam, based on Central Asian models that go back to the Buddhists. But he galvanizes that in a way that's very beneficial for the Muslims. And he creates, creates what are called the Nidhamiyas. These are great schools that are given his name by the Seljuk monarch. There's one of them in Nisapur, in Persia, in Sunni Persia, and Imam al-Ghazali begins to teach there. But he's so brilliant, you know, that he is then asked to come to Baghdad. And there's the great Nidhamiya, the greatest of all these schools in Baghdad. And al-Ghazali has all kinds of students, and he's extremely effective. And then in his free time, he studies other things. His tahafut al-Falasifa, for example, and his refutations of the esoterics, the Baltiniya. All of that he does in his free time. You know, he's teaching other things in his full time. He's writing, he's producing, he's doing everything. And then all of a sudden, he has a spiritual crisis. And that spiritual crisis, you know, when he is 20, when he's 37 years old, you know, this spiritual crisis remarkably, you know, um, occurs. And all of a sudden, he can't do anything. You know, it's almost as if he can't even speak. He can't even say the basmala. It's like, what happened to you? You know, is it the evil eye? Is it sorcery? What is it? You know, but he knows in his heart of hearts and his brother Ahmed, who is also a great uh, master of the way, he tells him, this is a warning to you. This is God. You know, and, but what's happened here is that Allah took away the acquisition. That, that you were not creating these acts. You don't have the power over this. This is a gift that was given to you. And what are you going to do with it? Are you going to be proud? Are you going to be arrogant? Are you going to be ostentatious? Are you going to seek this world? So Allah just takes it away. Then Al-Ghazali, it's like, you know, he can't do anything. And this happens to a lot of us in our lives too, just so that we know that I do not have the power. You do not have the power. God gives it to you. Therefore, be thankful for it. Okay, and so then Al-Ghazali leaves and he goes away, you know, for a number of years, you know, to get his heart right, you know, to learn to know his Lord and to get rid of the world so that he can come back and then finish his life in the most beautiful way. He's a great human being. Interestingly enough, when, she, when Imam al-Ghazali leaves Baghdad, you know, to take his path, at the same time a young youth who's 18 years old is coming into Medina to begin to study, and that's Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani. He comes into Baghdad at the same time that Imam al-Ghazali leaves. Okay, so the, the doctrine of acquisition is very profound and it's very beautiful. And it is a foundation upon which we base our faith and our worship. And again, who am I? I must know myself. 
You know, my essence is nothing. I am from Adam. I am from nothing. I am Dhalil. I am insignificant. You know, did I create myself? You know, whatever gifts that God has given me, a good mother, a good father, a good family, an education, eyes that can see, ears that can hear, did I do something to deserve that? These were all gifts that were given to me. On what basis? What did I do to deserve that? So I am insignificant. I am ta'if. I am ajiz. I am faqir. Totally contingent. And this is also what the doctrine of Kasb is telling us. That you're always that way. Do not be deceived by your action. And one of the beauties of this also is the fact that in this world, again, لَيْسَ فِي الْإِمْكَانِ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا كَانٌ you know, There is not in possibility anything better than what has been. Not because this is the best of all worlds. This is not the garden, and it's not the fire either. And horrible things happen. Look what's happening in Syria today. You know, these are horrors. And look what has happened in many instances in history. You know, this is not the resting place, but this is the testing place. And the test that we have here, whether we understand that today or not, it is filled with wisdom. You know, so we must do what is right. We must be strong. We must fight against evil. We don't submit to it. We're not passive. We don't say, this is the will of God, so I accept it anyway. No, that's not. We don't do that. You know, but nevertheless, you know, we understand that whatever happens in reality, it happens by virtue of the knowledge, the will, and the power of God, and human beings acquire it. And for that reason also, evil is never absolute. We have evil people. Look at some of the ones we've seen in our time, like this tyrant of Libya or this tyrant of Syria. Can you imagine anyone more evil than that? It's difficult for me to do that. You might have more experience, okay? But how many other people in the world over thousands of years have been worse? And yet maybe they never left their shop or their kitchen, you know, or their farm or, you know, whatever it was they had in life. You know, God empowers certain people as a sign to show what they will do. And yet, how many other people are like them? You take someone like Khalid ibn al-Walid, who is one of the most remarkable people in history. And what he does as a military genius and as a powerful human being who has the strength which is like third of 30 men, who can do that? I mean, I love Khalid. I'm amazed by Khalid. You know, he's really outstanding. You know, but how many Khalid ibn Walids are there who lived their whole life in an armchair? Or who lived their whole life in a wheelchair? Or who couldn't even walk? But had God given them the circumstances and the means to acquire the acts of Khalid ibn Walid, they would have done it. Maybe they would have even done more. So this is also, that's why God is the creator. And he gives you a certain area in which to work. And you have every right in that to function on the basis of knowledge. We have to increase our knowledge so that we know what is good and we know what is evil and we make the right choices. And we have the ability and the responsibility to choose. And we have the power to do. And God will then, as a rule, create for you the likes of the thing that you willed. Will it come to fruition or not? That's also for him. It's not for you. We try to do things in the best way that we can, right? We plow the field, we prepare the field, we put the seeds in the field, we water it, we follow the sunnah of Allah. We don't expect it to grow without that. Even though we know Allah is the one who makes it grow. But we have to do this. And we choose to do this. And sometimes it works in the next year we have a harvest, and the next year we have a harvest, and sometimes we don't. History is filled with examples like that. You know, especially military history. 
Military history is filled with examples of things happening that no, no one ever expect, expected. One of the great Prussian generals, his name was von Clausewitz, and he writes a big book on military history. And he made in that a huge mistake. He got a lot of things right. One of the things von, von Clausewitz said is you'll never find an atheist on the battlefield. He said you find two men that are soldiers, gamblers and believers. Gamblers and believers. And some people say you never find a disbeliever in the foxhole. You never find a disbeliever in the submarine when the depth charges start coming down, right? Uh, but he says the only thing you control in war is the first strike. This was the great flaw of the German military. You don't control that either. You don't control anything. And the history of war is filled with these strange things. You know, when Napoleon, for example, wants to invade Russia to conquer the world, he didn't know about the Russian winter? I mean, is he a fool? You know, Napoleon knows about the Russian winter, and he also knows that Russia is the land of rivers. The Russian people are a river people, and they live on the rivers, in the forests. And so how can you cross the rivers? You will be attacked the whole way. So the best time to attack is when the rivers freeze. Then we can just take the horses and the cannons over the rivers. We can get to Moscow in a relatively short time. We have good clothes and we'll spend the winter in Moscow. And then we can co conquer the rest of Russia after that. He had it worked out. The only thing is, is that that winter, the rivers didn't freeze. That winter, the rivers didn't freeze. So then he's there in the winter, and the winter's still a Russian winter. But he cannot cross a single river without a bridge. So he goes slowly. This is his defeat. He almost knows that from the beginning, but I can't turn back now. So Allah is the one who works in history as he wills. Bi idhnillahi ta'ala. And he allows you to do much good. If he would allow you to create good, if you had tafweed and tasleet, you would change the world. It'd be finished. You know, if the believer were allowed to do the good that every one of you wants to do by yourself, if you were able to have the effect that you would love to have, I mean, you know what you would love to do. You know how you'd love to see this country flourish and, and, and to tap its potential. And what we would all love to do the world would be so beautiful. It would be finished. Day of judgment. But it's not like that. Sometimes Allah, Allah allows us, as a special grace, to do amazing things. And we pray that in our lives, in this amazing generation, this really good generation, that you are the fruit, fruits of, you know, that we will be able over the next 50 years and 100 years to really do great things, to use this knowledge we have, to write beautiful bit, books, to produce beautiful documentaries and films and productions and communities. Okay? And maybe we can do it. And maybe we can. We don't, that we don't control. But we have the intention. And we have the knowledge, and we will increase our knowledge. We have the will, and we want to make the right decisions, and we have the power to act. And we ask Allah to create for us uh, the best. Okay, so this is really, this is a beautiful, sound description of reality. And it is one of the secrets of secrets. Also, this is one of the reasons why, if you want to act, and you want your act to be effective, the greatest thing that we can do is to turn that act completely over to Allah. You know, don't depend on your act. Don't regard your act to be yours. Because it is yours. God gave it to you. He gave it to you. But the fact is, I never forget if I have a brain that God is the one who gave us these acts, right? You can speak beautifully, you can teach beautifully, you can do wonderful things, but God gave you all of that. Okay, so turn it over to Him. Be thankful to Him. And then what happens? 
Because my knowledge, my will, my power, they attach to the act. They acquire the act. But what kind of knowledge do I have? You know, I'm like Ibn Atta Allah says, Ilahi, an al jahilu fi ilmi, fa kayfa la akunu jahulan fi jahli. That's me. Ana al jahilu fi ilmi. I am ignorant in my knowledge. Oh, I know some things. How much do I not know? How much do I not know about the little I know? That's the reality. Fa kayfa la akunu jahulan. I'm extremely ignorant in my ignorance. This is Sidq. He doesn't say that out of mujamala or tamalluq. This is Sidq. Okay? So then I have knowledge, I have will, I have power. I want to acquire these acts. I want to serve my Lord. I love my Lord. I want to thank my Lord. I want to thank Him with all my heart and all my soul and all my being and all my life. Okay? But if I turn the act over to Allah, then that act becomes an act that is the function of His knowledge, which is infinite, and His will, which is infinite and perfect, and His power. And then things begin to happen. This is also very important. This is why in your act, as beautiful as your act is, you want to give it up. You want to turn it over to Allah. Don't claim it for yourself. Even though it's yours, even though you chose to do it, but when you turn it over to Him, then that act becomes one that transforms history. And this is the reason, this is why they say, why the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the authentic hadith, that my servant does not approach me by anything dearer to me than what I have made obligatory. Five prayers a day, the fast of Ramadan, and so forth. Eating the halal, avoiding the haram. You know, may Allah bless our marriages. And those of you who are not married, may He give you beautiful marriages. You know, may the halal is everything. The halal is where the beauty is. The halal is where the pleasure is. The halal is where our life is. You'll never find it in the haram. Never. Wallahi, never. Not possible. You know, may we live that life, that beautiful life. Okay? My servant does not approach me by anything dearer than what I have made obligatory upon him or her. And then he or she, we can say that, the female is also in this process, does not continue to approach me by voluntary acts until I have loved him. Then God loves you. And when God loves you, everything changes. Then I become the eye with which he sees, the ear with which he hears, the hand with which he grasps, the foot with which he walks, and in other transmissions, the fu'ad, the heart with which he thinks, the tongue with which he speaks. Okay, and he does not ask me for anything but that I give it. Just like Asif with Solomon. Who can bring me the throne? He's testing. He knows. Suleiman could do it himself. But Asif, I will bring it to you but with a flash of an eye, just with a dua. And Asif can do this? No. This is Majaz Mursal, as we say. He makes the dua and there is the throne recreated by the grace of God right there in front of Solomon. This is true. This is possible. This happened. This is miracle. Okay. Then he does not ask me or she, but that I give them. And whoever offends one of my awliya, I have declared war against. May Allah enable us to understand these things. This does not contradict Tawheed in any way. But again, we're talking about Sharia and Haqiqa and the amazing ability of the human will to attach to the will of God. That's what it means. That now His will becomes my will. His knowledge becomes my knowledge. His power becomes my power. Not that He becomes God. No, that never happens. But this is what happens. We turn our act over to God. And then it becomes a function not of this ignorance, which is just a little bit informed, but of the knowledge and the wisdom of God. 
And then it becomes a function of the will of God. And then it becomes a function of the power of God. And then you see things happen. And that's why a lot of times in history, the things that the messengers and the prophets say have effects that are unbelievable. And you and I may work for years and years and years and we have no effect like that. And you know, the willy says a word and that word changes everything. So this is also part of the doctrine of kesp and iktisab, that you acquire the act, but the best thing is always to remember that this act was born in infinite knowledge, infinite will, and infinite power. So therefore, acquire it with adab. Acquire it with adab. Acquire it with consciousness. And this is also what we call mushahada. That witness God working in you. You know, you have a beautiful life. You have great ability. You do wonderful things. Who gave you the ability to do that? It is your choice. You did it, but there is this amazing complexity, this amazing beauty. And the more that you become conscious of that and you're able to turn it over to cre your Creator, then things begin to happen. We ask Allah to enable us to do that. So now, let's just talk a little bit about good and evil because of the fact that we promised to do that. <laughs> and um, this is it right here, good and evil. Um, I'm still working on it, you know, but um, let's just say a few things about it, you know. Um, you know, first of all, um, I'm, I'm going to try to cut this short, but, um, you know, God is good. You know, as the Prophet told us, uh, You know, that all good in its totality is in your hands. And evil does not pertain to you. Evil does not find a way to you. God is subuh. He is glorified above being evil in any way. And He is kudus. He is glorified above anything less than absolute perfection. The most beautiful act, the most beautiful reality is not comparable to Him. God is absolute beauty, absolute maj majesty, absolute perfection. But again, ليس في الإمكان خير مما كان. That He is the one who wills to test our identities in this very short world and to see who are we, who are you. May Allah give you a long life and a beautiful life and complete success in every way. But life is short. Even if we live a hundred years, life is short. And this is a time of testing. And we live in a dark, dark time. And we live in a time when the human being is in greater danger of perdition and destruction than ever before in human history. We live in a time of great knowledge and communication and travel. And we've built cities and we've done so much. And yet, there are a lot of shortcomings in that, which if the world is able to develop properly, maybe we can take care of. Maybe we can make this age really an age of greatness. You know, but the way it's going now, who would expect that to be the case? The next 20 years are not going to be like the last 20 years. And they may not be like anything you can even recognize. We don't know what's going to happen. And there are many, many complexities there. So, you know, we are here for a short time. And this is a very critical time. We must do everything that we can do. You know, we must use our talents. You know, we must acquire these acts properly. But God creates good and evil to test us. We are able to acquire the evil. We are also able to acquire the good. We seek that we can do that. But I think among the most important things in that is, first of all, that you know, in this deen, we have sharia and we have haqiqah. You have the, the prophetic law, the outward law, and this is real and true. And then you have the haqiqah that pertains to the structure of reality. 
the ultimate nature of reality. So usually in Aqidah we don't talk about that. But I myself think that it is important sometimes to talk about it, especially today. Because when you talk about good and evil, it's interesting that in the history of Islam, you know, um, it wasn't as much an issue as it has been among Jews and Christians. For the Mu'tazila, good and evil is an issue. And the Mu'tazila therefore insists upon the justice of God. They insist that God is just. Um, the Ash'aris insisted that God is all-powerful. He is the Qada. He does whatever he wills. So you don't have anything to say. And the Maturidis emphasize that he is the Hakim. That he is all-wise. That whatever he does, there is wisdom in that. And without any question, in all the things that God does, there is wisdom, there is power, there is justice, and there is bounty, fadl as well. And there are other things as well. But especially if we look at the history of the West, and in the West today, in the wake of World War II, you know, uh, what happened in World War II, in World War II, how many people were killed? You know, uh, the, the military personnel who were killed in World War II, in the Soviet army, in the Chinese armies, in, in the uh, Wehrmacht, the German army, in uh, the English army, the American army, the Italian army, the French army, are more than 40 million. More than 40 million. And what about the people in the cities that were bombed? You know, I mean, it was hell. It was absolute hell. I know people who lived in the war. I know people who were in the war on both sides. It was hell on both sides, absolute hell. And, um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, these realities have really affected the mentality of the West in the consequence of that. And then also we know about things like the slave trade, the slave trade that took millions of black Africans, many of whom were Muslims, against their will out of West Africa, where they had a beautiful culture, they have a beautiful culture there. I know it. I go there. Their villages are beautiful. Their customs are beautiful. They, are, they have wonderful ways of speaking with each other and, and doing things. A very natural environment. And they're ripped out of that against their will and sent across the Atlantic as slaves for how many years? And then into a capitalist, racist slave system, and then the life they live after that is even worse than the life under slavery. You know, we have Jim Crow and things like that that you may have heard of and you may not have. But this is always the question that comes up today. What about the untouchables of India? What about the Shudras, the lower caste? What about the scheduled tribes who live for how many thousands of years totally deprived, you know? Uh, what about the slave trade? What about this? What about that? What about the Black Death? You know, in the uh, 13th century, the Mongols come forth, the Tatar, as we call them, and they destroy much of Central Asia and Iran and much of the civilized world. But after that, the Mongols begin to build. And the Mongols were among some of the greatest state makers in history. And when the Mongols begin to build in China and Central Asia and elsewhere, uh, they created an economic system that was the prototype of capitalism. This has been studied by some great people like Janet Abu Lughat, who is an American Arab of Arab Christian descent. She has some beautiful things on that. You know? And this is, she believes the roots of capitalism was in this Chinese Muslim synthesis. It has money, it has hiwala, it has a type of banking system, it rationalizes markets, it controls finance, it is, it's like a type of proto-capitalism. And it flourished in Central Asia, it flourished in Iran, in Syria, in Egypt, uh, in Muslim Spain and Portugal, in Italy, and in Southern France, Provence, and in the lowlands, and in, even in England. And then, all of a sudden, in the 14th century, something happens that stops it forever. 
Do you know what that was? What was it that happened in the 14th century that brought the trade to an end and took the ships off the sea? The Indian Ocean was filled with ships, Arab ships, Persian ships, and then they're gone. What happened? Do you know? The Black Death, bubonic plague. And it was spread all through the world by the efficiency of the Mongol postal system. They had a berid, just as the Umayyads and Abbasids had a berid. And the germs of the bubonic plague, we believe, because we have historians who study disease, it came from Swat in what is today Pakistan. And then these, uh, these fleas were spread all over Central Asia and into China and into Europe by the postal system. And then the bubonic plague wipes out Eastern China. Europeans will always tell you what it did to them. They have this really um, blinkered view of history. It's like, yes, I mean, the Black Death was horrible in Europe and it ended the feudal system and it enabled changes to take place that probably could have never happened, but it lowered the Muslim world. It devastated the Muslim world. It took the Muslim world hundreds of years to be able to get back the populations that were destroyed in that. So what about that? What about the plague? What about war? What about starvation and things like this? And um, I think one of the most important things is that we have a response to that, which you could call aqidah and sharia. And you could call haqiqah and sharia if you like. That uh, from the standpoint of sharia, whenever there is catastrophe, whenever there is disease, whenever there is earthquake, whenever there is a tidal wave, Whenever there's destruction, we have an obligation to respond. We have an obligation to help. We have an obligation by the law to also take steps so that if that happens in the future, it will not be bad or it won't be as bad. Right? So this is very important because in Christian theology and in Jewish theology, the problem that you see that occurs over and over again is did God will this? Did God will the slave trade? Because if he did, we have to accept it. And this is the, re and this is the way that their theology has worked with it. That's the reason why things like the slave trade and things like the black death are theological problems for them. Okay, for us they are not, because God willed this as he willed all forms of evil. But it is a test, and he willed for you to respond to it. So therefore, the mere fact that God willed that this oppression take place, that does not justify it. It doesn't justify it at any point. And also it means right now, in the wake of that oppression, that we have an obligation to do what we can do to set it right. Okay? This is Sharia. So this is very important, this distinction. But when it comes to Haqiqah, or if you will, when it comes to Aqidah, I know in my heart that as horrible as these things are, and as painful as these things are, that this is the will of God. And therefore, it also has in it meaning and wisdom, and I must accept it. And it doesn't mean that I passively accept it. I will do everything I can do to still feed my family, to protect my family, to get them safe, to help my brothers and sisters. Okay, so this is very, I think, among the most important things. That when it comes to evil, we have a response to that. In fact, the ethical pinnacle of Islam, in my belief, is jihad and mujahada. You know, that we do jihad against evil. We do mujahad against evil. And always we see in the concept of jihad and mujahada that there are three qualities. There is something good that we want, something beneficial that we want. And then there is an obstacle that stands before it. 
and then we strive to overcome the obstacle to get the good. Okay, so there is an ethical good. There is a social good. And then there is something that obstructs it from us. So we strive to the utmost in order to overcome that obstacle to get it. This is why, for example, when a, a, a mother uh, conceives a child and, you know, she, um, and the child grows in her and it changes her hormones and everything and makes it impossible for her sometimes to be at ease and maybe she's throwing up, you know, her whole system has changed. She can't sleep. And this is really difficult. Okay, but what is the good? The child. That this beautiful child who is a gift to the world, you know, this, this is the only way that we can have this child. So she undertakes in herself all of these immense difficulties. And uh, then she delivers the child, which is extremely difficult. Okay, and then after that, she takes the child and she raises the child. And of course, we as human beings who are humane and also people who follow the law, we help her in that if we're decent, right? We work with her. This is our jihad, but that's her jihad. Always they're like that. So when it comes to evil, it is the obstacle and it has to be removed. And we have to strive against it to the utmost to remove it, to get the good, to unlock the good that is on the, on the other side. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the best of people are those who are keys to good. They are keys, mafatihul khayr. They are keys that open up the good. And they are magaliq al-shar. They are locks that lock down evil. This is ethical striving. You know, and we ask Allah to enable us to do that. Give us the keys to open up the good. Give us the keys to know knowledge. Give us the keys to teach this knowledge. Give us the keys to people's hearts. Give us the keys to teach people how to live and be happy. People are not happy today. People are not happy. You know, for all the Hollywood and all the Bollywood you see, they live in lives that are empty. And they know that as well, you know. Uh, and then you have the worst of people who are keys of evil and maghalik al-khayr and locked down good. And that's a lot of what is happening in the world today. We don't even know what it means to be human beings. We don't even know how to live as human beings. But you have the secret to that. You and we have to be able to give that secret to other people in this age of the monoculture. You know, this... this it, this uh, insipid, shallow, you know, uh, market culture, you know, that is destroying the world today, destroying all the cultures that are there, and creating, and this is, these are the words of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, bonsai human beings, human beings who look human, but they're like tiny little trees, you know, with, with, with roots that are strangled, and who can never face oppression, they can never face destruction, you know, I know the story of the Great Depression, you know, because um, my relatives lived in it. I, I was blessed to have relatives. My great-grandmother, Maud Stevens, may Allah have mercy on her, she was a believing woman, beautiful woman. She was born the year that Abraham Lincoln was shot. You know, she came west on a covered wagon. She told me about all of that, you know. What were the great dangers? She said the dangers were the rivers. That's what we were terrified. We weren't afraid of anything else. She said the Native Americans weren't a problem. She said the rivers, because we had to cross the rivers. There are no bridges. And you never know what will happen to your wagon. And you see people drown. You see wagons turn over. You know, she would tell me about all these things. I mean, you know, um, all of that, you know, the, the, these people that had roots and culture, all that's been annihilated today. You know, and we have to bring that back, ta'ala. You know, let the human being become a human being. But when the Great Depression came to them, I remember my, my grandfather, like he was doing really well. He was in western Kansas. He had good land. He was making money. He was newly married. He was married to the judge's daughter. You know, he has a, my mother and her sister and a little and then 1929, the stock market crashes. And then, you know, uh, the dust bowl, no rain, 
year after year after year, and the wind is blowing on the, on the panes of the house, the windows of the house all day. The attic is filled with dust. My grandfather never took the attic out, the dust out of his attic. As he said, I want you to go up and see that. This is the way it was in the Great Depression. You know, and they had nothing to eat. They had nothing. You know, they had government issued um, nickels made of cardboard that they could go to town to buy peanut butter. They lived off of peanut butter. My mother wouldn't eat peanut butter. She said, we had to live off of this for seven years. Nothing to eat. Cold, dry. The rains don't come. You know, and um, you know, that's the way they lived. But they could do it. You know, they helped each other. They worked with each other. They shared their clothes. They handed down. And my, my grandfather always said, the rain will come again. He said, it will come again. We will farm again. The land, and, and he stayed there. Everybody left. They'd go to California. They would go to uh, Chicago. But there are no jobs in Chicago. There's nothing to do. So he said, I will stay here. And he said, the rain will come back. When the rain came back, mashallah, he begins to farm. He buys all the land around him. All the land, everything you could see. Western Kansas is flatter than a pancake. Scientifically proven. He bought all of it. You know? And, but he always remained thankful. He, and he said, I'll never take the dust out of my attic. Because I want you to remember what we saw. But these were people who were strong. What if that should happen again? And it could happen again. You know, these kind of disasters are always possible. It's God's mercy that puts them off. But today, what, how will people respond to these things? You know, we, we are people who I don't believe have the strength that they had before. And may Allah make us strong. May He give us this humanity. <clears throat> may He enable us, you know, to, to teach each other and to learn from each other. But, you know, evil is a test. Evil is never absolute. And another thing, too, is that in the wisdom of God, evil will always flow into the same river, which is the river of wisdom and benefit. What do we mean by that? Like, Okay, what do I tell Africans you know, in America? There are millions of them, you know, whom I love, by the way, you know, who were uprooted. I mean, one of the first things, before I became a Muslim, I studied history. I studied the history of the Old South. I lived in the Old South. I grew up in the Old South. But, you know, I studied the history of the Old South, and I wrote a paper on the African background of the slave. You know, this was in 1967. And then I learned about the empire of Mali. I learned about Mansa Khan Khan Musa. I learned about Islam. I didn't become a Muslim. And I, I, this was amazing because I knew a lot of the Africans who were brought to America, this was their background. I really saw how great that was, okay? But, um, you know, um, you know, th this, uh, the evil that happens, you bring these slaves over, you take away their mothers, their fathers, their languages. They don't know if they're Mandinka, if they are Fulani, if they are Serir, whatever they are. They don't know anymore. They te speak pidgin English, you know, because their beautiful languages are taken away. Okay? And then they are oppressed in a way that you cannot even describe. You know, really. So what is the meaning of this? But, you know, Allah Azza wa Jal, as we said before, you take coal and put it deep in the earth and put it under uh, high temperatures, like volcanic temperatures, and pressure, and it can turn into a diamond. And this is a big sign. This is a reality because these people and other people, the Native Americans, the whites, the Hispanics, these people in America, it's like God can transform them. And He can make them into diamonds, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. And He can make this into good. And we hope and pray that that will happen. He has wisdom. Why did these people come? It was not abath. Wallahi, it was not abath. And when you see them in West Africa, and you see how beautiful they are, how noble they are, wallahi, you know, then you know, like, we have to give them this back. We have to give them back this humanity, you know, and then give them back the deen of their mothers and fathers, this beautiful deen of Islam. May Allah enable us to do that. Um, you know, we'll stop here. And uh, do we take questions tonight or we're off the hook? Uh, Tariq.
What do you say? Do we take questions tonight or am I off the hook? Captain Hook. Yeah. Huh? What do you want to do? Questions are difficult. <laughs> Questions are hard. You know. don't, don't think they're not. I keep them, you know. I'm going to try to get answers for them sometime. You know, but... Uh, so what should we do? ماذا نفعل الآن? So... <laughs> this is a great man, but I love this man, mashallah. And I'm honored that he would sit by me. He doesn't want to do that, but he should. This is a great scholar. This is a great scholar. This is the real McCoy. This is the real McCoy. May Allah bless him and enable him to get his PhD soon. All of you who are doing your studies, you know, and inshallah, serve this deen. Bring to life the legacy of the most noble of all human beings, the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. So, could we retire to your house, or how would we do that? Now, if you don't mind, we can stop here. Is that okay? You permit me? <laughs> you let me off the hook? Jazakallah <laughs> uh, And uh, inshallah, I hope that this is a beginning, and that we'll be able to come back and be able to cultivate friendships and be able to do great things in this wonderful land, the Ibni Lahi Ta'ala. Allahumma wa fiqna lima tuhibbuhu wa tarda wa ja'alna min abidika su'ada wa amitna ala kalimatil huda alimna ma yanfa'na wa wa fiqna lil amali bima alamtana bih wa ja'alna nahnu fihi khalisan mukhlisan li wajhika al kareem ya rabbil alameen. اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا بعده تفرقا معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محروما آمين 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 يا رب العالمين um, If you don't mind um, and if you don't have to do this if you don't want to but um, you know when the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم went to Medina he didn't want to go because he loved مكة that's his وطن and so, as he's going to Medina, he's very sad. He's going from the place that he loves best to the place that Allah loves best. And so, Allah revealed to him in Al-Juhfa. Al-Juhfa is the Miqat, it's the place where you can put on Ihram, that's about a hundred kilometers to the north of Jeddah. And when he was there, Allah revealed to him, that verily he, God, who made following the Qur'an, who made the Qur'an an obligation upon you, so you have to make hijrah. Because that's the Qur'an, he will bring you back ila ma'ad, at an appointed time. He'll bring you back to Mecca. You won't lose it forever. You know, so this verse, I believe, uh, because I was taught that and I've seen it. And you don't have to believe this, it's not a kita. But it has a secret that if we recite it, it will bring us back. So if you want, you know, we could stand up and we can recite the verse. And then when I say, this may sound very strange to some people, but if you step forward with the right foot, okay? This is the way we were taught. So maybe, inshallah, we do that. Okay? In the you repeat after me. In the levy, Tharaba, Alaika, Al Quran, Narad Duka, Ila, Ma'ad. So, inshallah, we'll be back. One year, two years, three, four years, I don't know, but we will be back, inshallah. Thank you very much. I've really, really enjoyed being with you. And uh, I hope we stay connected. This is what's very important, that we stay connected. Give me that. Assalamu alaikum. So if you permit me, maybe we sit here for a while, but then I have to go pack up, and there are other things to do. Ba'da idnikum. Is that permissible? Hmm? <laughs> okay, assalamu alaikum.